eight, uh, obviously, uh, the last couple of days uh, was bittersweet, uh, but man, uh, it, was, it was just good uh, to see how many people uh, Trotter's life affected. And it was just a reminder to me that uh, although uh, Mark may be gone, uh, <laughs> we can carry on the torch that certainly he, uh, he imprinted in, 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 in many of our lives. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, I just watched Sherry yesterday, Mark's wife, and as much as she could have been devastated, man, it's just amazing to me how much joy she had while she was singing some of those songs. And it's just, you know, uh, that's the example, guys. That's what it looks like. Uh, you know, I certainly don't want to lift a human uh, up to any kind of level. Uh, but man, if, if, if I ever saw an example of a Christian, it would be Mark Trotter. And, and I mean that. So if you've ever... Uh, if you didn't get an opportunity to meet him or, or get to know him, uh, listen, there are books. Uh, he has marktrotter.tv. Uh, there are avenues you can get to, to listen to him. Uh, I, I promise you, it is well worth your time. Uh, he just had a way of being able to teach uh, the Bible. And the good thing is, uh, he poured a lot of that into a lot of us. So um, hopefully we can... Uh, carry the torch uh, for as long as the Lord tarries, uh, which all I'm going to say, folks, is if there's ever been a time to step up your game, it's now. I'm just, take it for whatever it's worth. I am not a, I'm, I have no right to set a date of when the Lord is going to return, and I won't, but I'm telling you, man, watching what's going on, just seeing what's going on. I was just talking with Chris this morning. You know, I remember we did our Bible study back uh, in Rochester, New York, 10 years ago. I was talking about right around this time, time this time, 2021, 2022, when we start need to start. I certainly didn't know any better. I'm not a prophet. I, I was just paying attention to what Scripture said. And here we are, guys, and man, if we aren't getting close, I don't know. Uh, so with that being said, uh, uh, if, if there's ever been a time, man, it's now. I, 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 I really seriously believe that. All right, here we are in uh, page number 10 of our workbook. If you have that, uh, let's pick that up. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's where we finished last week. Uh, so number four, uh, where are the blessings? Uh, so let's go ahead and just uh, get this thing rolling here. Um, I, I want to first say right off the bat, I, I am not looking to – you're going to hear me say some things today that would almost seem like I might be calling some things out. And maybe I am. I don't know. I just want you to know, however I say it, uh, I don't mean it to come out in a way of attacking. I'm just trying to be as true as I can to what I believe and what this church believes uh, and what um, uh, our, our, the Living Faith uh, Fellowship believes. And uh, so just take it with, with that. Uh, if you're listening online, uh, certainly not trying to be condescending in any way, shape, or form. Uh, again, I'm a very factual person. So I'm going to try to be factual on some things, and it may sound and come off in the wrong way. That is not my intent at all. So if it does, uh, I just want to apologize up front. I'm just trying to be uh, real with it, if, if that's okay. Um, all right, so let's, let's start here. Where are the blessings? So we're, we're, we're going to talk about uh, these, these nine blessings. If you notice in verse number four, uh, well, let's start in verse three of Ephesians chapter one. Uh, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all, and, and if I had a pen and I was going to underline something, what does that say right there? Does that say anything about physical blessings? No, it says spiritual blessings, okay? And it says, where are those spiritual blessings? In heavenly places, and here's the term, watch 
how often Paul drops this in the book of Ephesians, in Christ. You don't have these blessings unless you're in Christ. We're going to be dropping that a lot. So uh, every time you see it, uh, underline it so you, so you can really grab onto it. Uh, verse 4 says, according as he hath chosen, and remember what I said last week, who's the us, chosen us in, Christ, in him, in Christ, right? Uh, uh, before, when did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. That's important to understand. We're going to talk about that. That we, so here, here's the crazy part about it. It's telling us what was chosen. Like, read it. Just read it. What does it say? We were chosen for what? To be saved? No. We were chosen that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. That's what was chosen before the foundation of the world. That's exactly what it says. Okay? And then it says, having predestined us unto what? The adoption of children. And we're going to talk about that because it's a very important to understand. Uh, in, in today's church, you're going to hear things like this. Well, we're all children of God. Well, if we are, then the Bible is messed up. Because the, the Bible's got this thing messed up. No, we are not all children of God. Stop it. No, we are not made in the image of God. Stop it. That's not what the Bible teaches. Was Adam and Eve made in the image of God? Yes. But after Adam and Eve fell, we were made in Adam's image. Genesis 5.3. And if you think that that's a, 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 a crazy thought, let me help you with something. If we're all made in the image of God, then why the heck is God trying to transform us back into his image? I mean, we, we got some scripture to prove that that's what he's doing. So it, it just doesn't add up. And, and I'm going to tell you why we've gotten to that place. Why we've gotten to that place is because of this teaching that's going around that we call Calvinism. That's how we got to that place to start teaching this stuff. Uh, and I'm going to show you today, hopefully, well, it might be wrong. Uh, maybe. So let's, uh, let's see how that works out. All right, he says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's the first blessing of the Father. The second blessing of the Father is having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Well, you need to know what his will is. And once you understand what his will is, it throws Calvinism out the door real fast. I'm going to show you that, okay? And to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he made us accepted in the beloved. So these are the three blessings of the Father. Get it, man. He has, he has uh, number one, he has made us holy and without blame before him in love. Amen. Okay, number two, he has predestined us unto the adoption of children. Amen? And number three, he has uh, made us accepted in the beloved. Those are the three blessings of the Father. Uh, what we're going to find is that there are nine blessings. Three have come from the Father. Three have come from the Son. Three have come from the Holy Ghost. Okay, and so we're going to learn about those over the course of the upcoming weeks. So, so where are these blessings? Well, verse number three tells us that these blessings are where? In what? Heavenly places. Amen? Okay. The unsaved person and a Laodicean, a Laodicean is primarily interested with who? Self. Okay. Is interested uh, primarily in earthly blessings. Why? Because this is where he lives. Jesus called those interested in these types of blessings as the children of this world. Luke 16, 8. For a Jew and a Laodicean is more interested in blessings and promises realized on the earth. The Christian's life and promises, however, are realized and centered where? And if you don't believe that, go read Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Paul makes that very clear, okay? The heavenlies describe the place where Jesus Christ is right now. This answers what's going on in Ephesians 2. You understand? We sit here and we go, how can we, be, how can we be seated in heavenly places right now? Right now, as we all are gathered together, 
Bill didn't see that. If we were all gathered together, he had his face down. I did not put my feet down there. I did not do that. Um, am I lying? I don't lie. I, could, I did, Bill. I'm sorry. My apologies, man. Uh, I'm going to step back up here. Okay, so listen. How can we be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus right now? That's what exactly what Ephesians 2, 6 says. And you go, well, how can that be? Let me tell you. Because where is Christ seated right now? And if we are in Christ, we're there right now with him. Amen. And i got to ask the question, if that's where we are right now with him, how can we be in heaven? Can we get kicked out of heaven? I mean, think about it. If you're going to say you can lose your salvation, what you're saying is you can get kicked out of heaven. Well, did, you, did you do anything to get there? Well, what makes you think you're going to, what are you going to do to get out of there? This is very important. We've got to understand this. It's the fact everything we have, everything we are, has nothing to do with you or me. Everything we have, everything we are, is because of Him. If we can wrap our brains around that, then maybe we can be Christian. And you say, what are you, what, 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 you say, I'm not a Christian? What is a Christian? A Christian is not someone who just claims to be a Christian. A Christian is a Christ follower. If you're a Christ follower, that means you're doing what Christ did. That's it. If you're not doing what Christ did, then you are a disciple. You say, wait a minute, I thought we weren't called. Exactly, see my point? What do you want to be? Do you want to be a disciple? Because disciples can turn away from him. You understand? John 6. Christians aren't going to turn away from him. Christians are in Christ, and Christ is in them, and nobody is going to pluck that out of his hand. Nobody. And if that's where you are, I would argue, why would you ever go back? How could you ever go back? You understand? This is very important understanding. Our, uh, uh, a Christian's citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.10. His name is written in heaven, Luke 10.20. His father is in heaven. His attention and affection ought to be centered on the things of heaven, Colossians 3. And he's laying up his treasures, where? In heaven. This is all spiritual stuff. This is our spiritual blessings. We aren't doing anything for this world. We're not of this world, just like he was not of this world. We are living in the world, but this world is not our home. We are strangers and sojourners to it. Our citizenship is in heaven. You, if you grab onto and understand that, you're going to realize just how ridiculous it is to think that we can lose that. You can't because you didn't do nothing to get it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I want you to grab onto that. These heavenlies uh, describe the place where Jesus Christ is right now and where the believers, believers are seated with him right now. So listen. By understanding that, then you're going to understand that the battles we fight are not with flesh and blood, the physical. They're with what? The satanic powers. Where? In heavenly places. Now you know what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 6. That's our battle. Our battle isn't on the physical realm. Our battle is in a heavenly realm. That's where the battle's being fought. And to fight that battle, you can't fight it with, you know, armor or a sword or, or, or a shield. And I mean that in a physical sense. The only way you can fight the battle is with the armor and the sword and the shield. Job 41, hello. He's the only one that can show you who 
Satan really is. If you don't allow this to be your protection, what's going to happen is Satan, who's trying to mimic it all, (laughs) guess who he's going to get you focused on? Come on. Guess. You remember the I will statements of Satan over there in Isaiah? I will. I. You'll be, God knows in the day you eat of the fruit, you'll be like, he's going to get you focused on self. And when he gets you focused on self and you lose sight of what we're really here for and what we really were made for, that's where it's all going to fall apart. Understanding who we are, understanding what our purpose is, understanding what his will is, really matters and you can't get out of these first 13 verses of ephesians 1 without understanding that because that's what paul is stating right here he's telling us okay physically the christian is on earth in a human body in a war against their own flesh but spiritually he is seated with christ in heaven in the heavenly sphere and it is in this heavenly sphere that provides the power and direction for the earthly walk so that we can defeat the flesh if you were listening to uh, uh, trotter's uh, 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 funeral service yesterday you heard you, you heard justin say it right if Mark was going to say anything, if his last words were going to be anything, it'd be what? Walk in the flesh. No, no. Walk in the Spirit. That's the most important thing. We need to realize what our flesh is capable of and that our flesh in it dwells no good thing. And if we ever think we can do anything in the flesh, I promise you, you will lose. That's why we got to be very, very careful puffing ourselves up to the point of ever saying, I'll never do that. Pride comes what? Before a fall. No, no. If you try to do something in you, I promise you, you will fall because Satan's got you right where he wants you. You will, and he'll use anybody and anything to make sure you fall. No, you can do nothing without him nothing, and you will fail at everything without him. You say, well, that's not true. Yes, it is. From a spiritual standpoint, yes, you will. Now, if you're okay with physical stuff, yeah, maybe you, can, you, maybe you won't fail in some physical things. Maybe you can make a lot of money. Maybe you can have a big house. Maybe you can do all the things you do. But what are those things going to do for you in the spiritual realm? You see? Okay. So we got to get this. Most Christians, unfortunately, will never get to the point where they fully realize or understand this, where the battle really is. The fact that Paul is writing about wealth would be significant to his readers, because we've talked about this, because Ephesus was considered the the bank of Asia. One of the seven wonders of the world, the great temple of Diana, was there. It was the center for idolatrous worship, and it was also a depository for wealth. In this letter, Paul will compare the church of Jesus Christ to the temple and will explain the great wealth that Christ has in his church. Paul uses the word riches, inheritance, and fullness, or filled, many times. And and I think I wrote down uh, most of those for you there. So so what Paul is saying to us is God has given us spiritual blessings, so be rich. Rich with what? Money? No. Be rich with the spiritual blessings. Listen, and here's, I got nine of them right here for you. Ready? Your destination has been predetermined. Already once you are in Christ. You have been accepted by God. You have been redeemed and forgiven. God has abounded. I wonder why God would do that. God has abounded towards you in all wisdom and prudence. Get this, he makes known unto us his will. By the way, 
this is a great privilege. You do not need to wonder what his will is. You are going to have an inheritance. Now listen, if there's anything you can lose, this is what you can lose. So don't lose it. John talks about it, making sure that you get your full reward. Why would he say that? We are sealed with the Spirit. The glory of God will be in you. It Just stop for a second. Can you even imagine? God put his glory in you. I would guarantee you that if we really truly got that, we would not act the way we act, especially towards one another. No way. There's just no way. It's in you, man. And finally, we have hope in glory. We have hope. And that hope is not, well, I hope it happens. No. You've been sealed until the day of redemption. Until the purchase price has been done with it, we are see it's already done. Yeah. If it's already done, how can you get out of it? Do you see the problem there once you really grab onto it and understand it? Now, what I would say is then stop acting like the person you were and start acting like what you've been called to be. That's the point Paul's making in these next couple of chapters. This is what you were, but now. Right? We love the butt around here. Right? We were all here on Friday night when I sang to my wife. Remember when I first met her? Right? I was staring at her what? Come on, Robert. Her personality. I was loving her. Robert's like, I'm not even going to say it. We love the butt. B-U-T. Why? Because if it wasn't for the butt, that's what we would be. That's what we, dang it. All right. I don't like to quote authors very often, but I think it's okay as long as the context is proper and correct. C.I. Schofield said this, talking about Ephesians. In his writings alone, we find the doctrine, position, Walk and destiny of the church. And I would agree with that 100%. You want to understand what the doctrine, the position, the walk, and the destiny of the church looks like? Yeah. Paul's writings uh, will uh, uh, clearly define that. A.C. Gabaline wrote this. The highest and most glorious revelation which the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has been pleased to give, he has given through the Apostle Paul. The two prison epistles to the Ephesians and Colossians embody this completion of the Word of God. And I agree with that. The Ephesian epistle holds the place of preeminence. I would agree with that. The revelation which is given in this epistle concerning believing sinners whom God has redeemed by the blood of his Son and exalted him into the highest possible position is by far, let me emphasize, by far the greatest revelation you and I could ever realize. You get this, now you know what your purpose is. You've answered all the questions. Come on now, why am I here? What's my purpose? Where am I going when I die? What? All those questions get answered right here. Why am I here? For the glory of God. What's my purpose? To bring him glory. Where do I go when I die? Well, I'm already in heavenly places, so I think there's the answer. If you're not, what's the alternatives? All right. I already read the verses, so I suppose we don't need to do that again. Uh, number one, understanding of the passage. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 is clouded with confusion. So we need to get a sense for what this passage is saying. 
Calvinism has clouded the minds of many because of this passage. What I want you to understand in verse number four is we have been selected for a holy position in love. Number five, God's will and plan, his purpose, was for us to be children of God. Because Adam was a son of God. Was he a son of God after he fell? And let me just help you, there were no sons of God on planet Earth until Jesus came. Hence the reason the title. Y'all with me on that? Do you understand? Most people don't understand what I just said. Make sure you grab onto what I just said. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was, come on, with God and was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory of the only begotten of the Father. Yeah? And as many as received Him, He gave the power to become. Who gave that power? Jesus did. Why? Because Adam lost it. There were no sons of God from Adam till Jesus. If you think that, now, now you know why it's blasphemous to say that the Old Testament people got saved. Looking forward to the cross. No, they didn't. No, they did not. There were no sons of God. None. Until Jesus came again. He was the second Adam. He gave us that power that we had lost. And what is the power of God? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Nobody, there were no sons of God on planet earth. You go, wait a minute, they talk about the sons of God over there in the Old Testament, over in Genesis 6 and and Job 1. Do you know who the sons of God were in the Old Testament? Angelic beings. That's what they were. If you just read what it's saying, it's not hard to figure out. Adam and Eve was that until they fell. And then they became flesh and blood. And something different happened. So the Son of God, Jesus, had to come to give us that power again. See, now, yes, we can say from an earthly standpoint, to help us understand if we need to. Jesus is the Son of God. I get that. I understand that. I get the title behind that, to help us understand that he had no earthly father. His father was the heavenly father. But don't stop there, because it means so much more that he was the Son of God. The Son of God, that title, was because he was giving us the power to get something that we had lost. And he's the only one that could have given it. And so when he's in you, guess what happens? You get adopted into his family. Do you see why saying that we're all children of God is wrong? We aren't all adopted into his family until we are, say the word for me. We're going to keep saying it. In Christ. Help me. Thank you. That's when we become adopted into his family. That's when we become sons of God. You are not a son of God until you are. Y'all with me? Hence the reason why when we're. When I do this, that's my little in Christ, okay? Just so y'all know. When we're in Christ, that is the reason why he is trying to transform us back into his image. Jesus Christ was the express image of God. Jesus was. Could anybody be made in his image without Jesus Christ? No. And if you're not in Christ, are you in the image of God? No. Do you know what an image and a likeness is? Think, just think. What is an image? It's a representation of something. What is likeness? You're like it. Prior to salvation, were you in a representation of Jesus? Were you, in a, were you like God? No. Did you have attributes like God? Yes, but they had died. Your attributes were dead. You couldn't love like God did. You couldn't do the things that God did. Why? Because you were dead. That's what Paul's saying in Ephesians 2. 
That's why he had to quicken you, make you alive, so that he could put his life in you to make you what you were supposed to be. Are you going to realize that in this life? No, you're not. But that's why there's the three tenses of salvation. There's justification, there's sanctification, and there's glorification. When, as Trotter is right now, as he's with the Lord, he is like him. He, he's realizing it now. He's seeing it. He's as he is. Do you understand? This is very important to grab onto because, man, what it helps us understand, let me tell you the implications of this. You never know just how really saved you can be until you know just how lost you really are. And that's the problem that I see in many churches today. We're not telling people just how lost they really are without him. What we're telling people is how we can live a good life now and make everybody feel happy now. Fine, great. You want to make people feel happy about themselves, do what you got to do, but you're sending them right to hell while you're doing it. No, we got to know just how really lost we are. Because if you do, that really will start to make us realize just how Laodicean we are. If we make any of this about us, any of it at all, it's Laodicean. We're about ourselves. This isn't about us. This book is not about us. This book is about him on his throne for all of eternity. That's what it's about. That's the purpose. That's the point. He's trying to get us back to where we were and way, the way it was supposed to be in Genesis. All Genesis to Revelation is, is a going in a big circle, going back to this is the way it was. This is how we lost it. This is how we get it back. And guess how we get it back? Guess how we get it back? Through Jesus. That's how. No other way. It took God in the flesh to remedy the problem. And no, that is why he is the way. That is why he is the truth. That is why no man will come out of the Father but by him. Because without him, we're nothing. Oh, we might be something in this life, but that's as far as that will ever get you. We're nothing because nothing in this life matters but him. That's it. Everything, letter B, everything is contingent on being, everything is. This throws rocks in the face of Calvinistic thinking. It just does. Let me, let me kind of uh, uh, help you with something here. If you're not in Christ, then these promises are not valid to you. Christ is the head of the church. He is the core of Christianity. If there was no resurrection, there is no Christianity. Why? Because what is Christianity? If you don't hear a word I said this morning, pay attention because I'm about to hit, drop it like it's hot right now. <laughs> hear me right now. Ready? If you don't, what is Christianity? Christianity is you were dead. Christ came down from the heavens and died on a cross and paid your price. Y'all with me? Yeah. Now, listen. Listen. You need to take your flesh just as Christ did and nail it to his cross so that you realize you're dead. So that you and me can get buried. Get rid of that old stuff, man. If any man be in Christ, he is a... Romans chapter 6, 3 through 6. I'm preaching it right now. If you think I'm, 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 I'm giving you some kind of... Craziness, right? No. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans 6. You need to be dead. Why did Jesus say, pick up your cross? Daily. Why? Because he knows that if you don't pick up your cross daily, you are going to walk in the flesh. What is a cross? A cross is a place of death. Uh, man, I love uh, uh, the way Tozer uh, uh, wrote it out. 
uh, A.W. Tozer, man, if you've never seen it, if you've been around this church, we've talked about it. The old cross versus the new cross. Do yourself a favor and go read it. It's not very long, but oh boy, that brother back in the 50s was nailing it. He's got to be rolling in his grave seeing what's going on today. The new cross entertains people. The old cross killed people. We got to understand that, man. We need to die on that cross with him. We need to bury who we are, all of our aspirations, all that we want, all that we are. Get rid of it because none of it was pleasing to him. None of it was. Well, I'm a good person. Well, then the Bible lied because the Bible says there is none good. No, not one. Well, I'm righteous. No, the Bible says there's none righteous. We're all guilty before him. You understand? You got to kill that. That line of thinking needs to be killed. Hello, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's got to get killed. It needs to be buried, never to be seen again. We need to raise as the new creature we are, Christ in me, so that I can now live my life. I think I'm preaching a verse here. What does Galatians 2.20 say? Huh? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I. But if you don't, you suffer. You suffer the grace of God. You frustrate it. The, the very thing that God created you to be, you're frustrating it. The grace that he gave you wasn't just his love because he loved you. Did he love you? Yes. But that's not why he gave you the spiritual blessing of grace. He gave you the spiritual blessing of grace so that you can be his workmanship. We've got to grab onto this, man. A Christian is a Christ follower. Stop saying you're a Christian if you're not doing what he told you to do. Am I being too hard? I'm just trying to be real, man. This is what's going on in church today, man. We're teaching people to love yourself. You can be anything you want. Listen, you're, you're right. You can be anything you want. Go ahead. Be whatever you want. I'm going to be Christ. Because that's what I'm supposed to be. If I can be anything I want, if I have to make a choice of what I want to be, throw it all out the garbage in the garbage and let me just be like Christ. That's all I need to be. Paul says it, right? That I may know him, that I may suffer with him in his resurrection, that I may know it. That's what we need, man. That's all we need. That's all it's about. That's what Paul is trying to hammer home here in Ephesians. And, and by the way, being in Christ doesn't mean you were chosen to be in Christ. You know, I told these guys, we are going to get through 18, page 18 today. Yeah. That ain't going to happen. But man, this is, uh, it's okay. We got we to gotta grab onto this stuff. This is important, man. We got to make sure we're grabbing onto this. Christ is the head of the church and the core of Christianity. Our Christianity is only as good as Christ in us. We can run around and call ourselves Christians all we want. We can run around and play the game all we want. We can run around and, and, and say all the words and act it all out all we want. Christ knows. The Word of God will reveal it to you, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. The Word of God's got this. It understands who you really are. First of all, I'm back in the notes here. Let's be sure that we recognize that if this verse is teaching that sometime before the foundation of the world, God had already chosen each of us who would be saved, then what the verse is teaching is that we were actually in Christ before the foundation of the world. If, if that's the case, if God chose us as the Calvinistic teachings will tell us, then, then okay, uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go, okay, if that's true, then let's, 
let's read what it's saying here. If what it was in verse 4 is that he chose us before the foundation of the world, then that means he chose us before the foundation of the world. He, he chose me. Sorry, David, he didn't choose you. Okay. He chose me and not David before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. So that means before the foundation of the world, before I was ever even thought of, I was in Christ. Do you see the problem with that? If we were placed in him, in your notes, before the foundation of the world, it obviously poses a huge problem. The Bible becomes a contradictory issue. I said that wrong. It becomes a contradiction. That's really where I wanted to go. Well, listen, the Bible clearly states that prior to our salvation, we were in Adam. Was Adam in Christ? Because if he was, why do we need a second Adam? So if what Calvinistic teaching is, is correct, please pull 1 Corinthians 15 out of the Bible. Because that's Paul's teaching completely against that. Okay. Next thing is, is that uh, uh, we were, the Bible teaches us that we were in trespasses and sins. Look, look at Ephesians 2, you're right there. And you have he quickened who were, this is what you were. You were dead in trespasses and sins. If I'm in Christ, how could I possibly be dead? See the problem? If, if I was chosen... How could I have ever in my whole existence ever been dead? Because it had to be before the foundation of the world to make this thing, to, to make this thing swing right. You see the problem? I was in the lust of my flesh, Ephesians 2, 3 tells us. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh and of the mind. Listen, if I was in Christ then that means I already had the mind of Christ. If that's the case, then Romans 12 makes no sense now. So now let's throw out Romans 12. I mean, these are important chapters we're throwing out of the Bible, just so you know. Okay? Listen, listen. And it tells us where we were. Look at verse 12. That in that, that, in that time you were without Christ. You see that right there? I mean, it's telling you. At that time, you were without Christ, without God in the world. Well, if I was chosen before the foundation of the world and I was in Christ, that means I was sitting in heaven places with him. How could I have been in the world? Do you see the problem here, guys? I'm trying to make, I could give you a lot more. I'm just trying to show you. Well, we got to solve these problems then. There is an, we have to have an answer for this. Are we to believe then that in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, God placed us in Christ and then somehow we got out of Christ and we were found in Adam, in trespasses and sins, in lust of our flesh, in the world, only that sometime later God would put us back in Christ again? That all seems very strange. In fact, or the fact is, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 must be understood within the very principle of Bible study. All my Trotter fans. Context. Do not assume the us. Well, that would just bring in my life. Because my life is in Christ.
Huh? Oh, there we go. The Lord taketh away and he giveth. I changed the verse around a little bit. All right. In fact, in Ephesians 1 through 4 through 5, must be understood with the very principle of Bible study, context. Don't assume the us is us individually. That's why I went through that exercise with you last week. In the context of the book of Ephesians, even more specifically, in chapter 1, Paul's introducing to us something that no believer in Christ had actually understood prior to the writing of the book of Ephesians, and that was the mystery of the church. In other words, the fact that the church spiritually is as much the body of Christ as was the physical body that Christ lived in during his 33 years on the planet. If you understand that, you're going to understand his prayer in John 17, which I would say is the Lord's prayer. Okay? So, so it goes like this. Yes, Ephesians 1.4 clearly teaches that God made a very definite decision before the foundation of the world. No questions asked. But what is it that it was actually choosing? Does the verse actually say that he's choosing individuals to salvation? No, that's not what it's saying. What the verse says is that before the foundation of the world, God chose that the church, the body of Christ, all of us who exercise our will by faith, call upon, calling upon him to save us, would be different people than any other people who have ever lived because what we would be... Oh, y'all aren't looking at me. Two people, come on, everybody. In Christ. Okay. Oh, are you? Yeah, you are. I can't tell that. Sorry. Listen, listen. That, that, that if you were in Christ, that you would be holy and without blame. That's what was chosen. And can I tell you why that was chosen and why God could make that commitment to us? Because if we're in Christ, are we holy and without blame? Because we're Christians... Who, who, when God looks at us now, what does he see? Is Christ holy and without blame? Oh, man, that makes that verse so easy now. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, Calvinistic thinking is completely wrong. They completely botched that. No. Understand what it means to be in Christ, and you understand why he can make that promise to us. And by the way, the promise wasn't even necessarily to us. How about that? The promise was to the Son. God chose before the foundation of the world that our salvation would place us in Christ. Yes, I agree, Carr. And why did God the Father choose to give us that standing? Verse 4 goes on to tell us, it was so we could constantly, regardless of our attitude, our disposition, our sin, or anything we do or do not do, be holy and without blame before him in love. The only way that could ever possibly be a reality is for God to have chosen to place us in Christ, so that when he looks at us, he does not see you or I, but he sees his son, who has always, even before the foundation of the world, constantly been holy and without blame before him in love. Do you realize that the only people who could ever say that they possessed this spiritual position of being in Christ are the people that are living in the dispensation of grace? Do you realize how importantly Important. That was a bad way to say it, but I'm saying it anyways. Do you understand what privilege we have? And if you don't understand dispensations, you're not going to understand that privilege is to us. It is a monumental privilege. And we are squandering it like little babies. Because we're too busy living for us. Is, is this helping anybody this morning? Because, man, I'm preaching this stuff, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. And I've already knew all this because I'm the one that wrote it. Although I did steal some of this from Pastor Mark. I ain't going to lie. 
Do, do, do you realize that as wonderful as God thought Noah, Daniel, and Job were, they were never in Christ a day in their life? That exclusive standing was something God decreed before the foundation of the world, that we would be totally unique believers when God was carrying out his plan on the earth through this extraordinary thing called the body of Christ. And again, note, it was not revealed until Paul was called. Nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. It wasn't revealed. When, when one reads carefully Ephesians 3, 1 through 12, and if the Lord tarries long enough, maybe one day we will get there. But listen, they will see that the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord was that it would be the church that would know the manifold wisdom of God having been placed in Christ. I mean, this is revolutionary. This is life-changing. This is a revealing that if we get it, oh my, make sure you understand that what God is actually trying to communicate in and through the book of Ephesians is that, is that those of us who have put our faith and our trust and our belief in the church age, in Christ, are the only ones who have ever had the distinct privilege of being holy and without blame before him in love. And moving further into verse 5, do you realize that the only ones who have been predestined under the adoption of children are those of us who are believers in the church age? And again, notice what the verse actually says, is that God wasn't predestinating who would be saved, but rather the fact of those of us who are saved in the church age would have the glorious privilege as a benefit of our salvation to be adopted as God's children. Is anybody digging this? Because I'm digging it. And do you now see why it is that believers in the church age are eternally secure. And why that was not true for an Old Testament saint, or it could be true for a tribulation saint. Do you see why rightly dividing is so important? It's because we are the only ones who ever been or will ever be placed in Christ our robes aren't washed with the blood. We are washed in the blood. And if you understand what I just said, you'll understand what's going on in Revelation 7 and how that's not us. And if you understand how that could not be us, then you will understand how you could never put the church in the tribulation. Because if you put the church in the, in the tribulation, well, now we need to be washed. Our robes need to be washed. And that is a con complete contradiction to what Jesus says about his church being washed in the blood. We don't get our robes washed. We are washed in the blood. Do you realize how much false doctrine we're calling out right now? If you put the church in the tribulation, you got some, you got some answering to do. Alice, my older people understand that. Lucy, is it Lucy? I was thinking, I was thinking of the other one there. What's yeah, you know, honeymooners, good, good, good show right there. All right, we are the only people who have ever or will ever have their righteousness and acceptance with God not based on who we are or what we do. Praise the Lord, thank you, hallelujah, but based on you already, you already should fill it in who Christ is, and what he has done. And if that's the case, how can you lose that? How? Calvinist grace is not necessarily Christ's cross for you, but God's choice of you. If this is true, then when you were born in the womb, you were not in sin, you were in Christ. 
and then when you came out of the womb, you began to blaspheme God and the gospel while you were in Christ. Do you see the problem with this? Now, I know I'm getting a little technical about it, but I want you to understand what is really we're saying. If we're, that's, I think that's a big problem in the church today. In the church today, you know what we do? We have these, these people that are standing at pulpits, and they're preaching stuff, just like I'm doing this morning, and what they're preaching is fluff. The, me, for me, it's just the way my mind thinks. If you ever hung around me long enough, you know that this is how I think, right? I look at a statement, I go, okay, if that's true, forget all the middle stuff. What does that logically mean in the end? That's just the way my mind thinks. I go right to the end because to me, you got to know where it leads to if it's true or not. If you know where it leads to, then you go, okay, that's obviously not right. I know that ain't true. Let me, I want to close with this. Yeah, 18, 13. The, the three and the eight are close. Yeah, I do. Listen. Let me close the time of it. Let me close the time of it. Five minutes. Eight 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 minutes. E
So you can call yourself Reformed tradition. You can call yourself Reformed Christianity. You can call yourself Reformed this or Reformed that or whatever it is. Listen, you are still Calvinist. You're still teaching Calvinism, which, by the way, isn't Calvinism. It's Augustinianism. Remember what I told you last week? I hope some of you went back and looked to make sure I wasn't jiving you. I'm telling you the truth. Calvin himself, most of his important doctrines of Calvinism, he states he got it from Augustine. Now watch, watch. Here are some players. Do what you do. Do what you want with this information. Okay. I just want you to know, because most people don't, because they call themselves something different. You don't. They're going to hide it very well to, from you. Mark Driscoll, Tim Keller, Francis Schaeffer, Albert Moeller, who happens to be the president of the Southern Baptist Convention which, by the way, 30% of the Southern Baptist uh, uh, seminaries today identify with Reformed Baptist theology. Brian Chappelle, David Platt, Arthur Pink, R.C. Sproul. Here's one everyone's about to probably shoot me with. John MacArthur, Alistair Begg, Francis Chan, to a point, although he is definitely accepting Roman Catholic doctrine today. Paul Washer, Lou Giglio, John Piper. Uh, they're, big, they're big in that passion movement where, which many young Christians are being swept into today. This is all Reformed theology teachers. And I'm telling you, I've read their books. I've listened to their sermons. If you don't know how to catch what they're saying, little leaven starts getting inserting. And now you're caught up in something that is not biblically correct. It's not. It's just a fact of the matter. Do what you want with, you, with that as you will. Let me tell you what some of these people have written in their books. Calvinists emphasize that their theology rests upon solid biblical exegesis that is firmly based on the Word of God. You start reading some of these people's books, and you'll grab. That's what the. I mean, if you were to read John MacArthur, he will sell that to the nine. Yet, you start listening to his sermons, and he's constantly correcting the Word of God. Constantly correcting it. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Theology rests upon the sol solid biblical exegesis, firmly based on the Word of God, but when you're reading and quoting scriptures, well, you see that word right there? That's not what God really meant. Let me tell you what it meant. So you became the authority in God's word? How did that happen? When did you become the authority? And he's big. A lot of people listen to that guy. And listen, I ain't going to say he hasn't said some good stuff. But he said some wrong stuff too. And, and some of the wrong stuff he says is really wrong. You know, like, the blood really wasn't all that important. It really didn't purchase anything. It was his death that was important. That's not what that book says. <laughs> you take, yes, yes, his death was important. But his death had to be a shedding of blood. If you, if you separate those two in any way, shape, or form. But leading Calvinists insist that it requires special preparation for anyone to become qualified to examine and understand Calvinism as it's taught in the Bible. What does that sound like? In other words, you have to have given special preparation to understand it, and you can't fully understand it without me. You, you just could never get there. I think that's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That sounds an awful lot what the Catholic Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholic Church teaches. You can't understand your Bible without, the, without, the, without me. So you may as well just shut it, John MacArthur. Just shut it. I'll tell you what it says. And I'll correct it where I need to correct it to make sure you understand it. <laughs> no. no that, that, that is an emphatic no. No. How about this? You will hear, uh, uh, and I've talked to many of, a uh, of people that teach this type of stuff. You'll hear stuff like this. You just can't understand it. You, 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 Calvin, how about this? 
How about this? Calvinism is the gospel and true Christianity. Did y'all hear what I just said? Speaking on the five points of TULIP, if you know what I'm talking about, this is what one of these guys said. The great advantage of the Reformed faith is that it is the clear framework of what the Bible teaches about salvation. Yet, I can't understand it because there's no way I can fully understand it unless I'm qualified. So I can't understand salvation unless I'm qualified to understand it. Well, that just shoots simplicity in Christ right out the door. I guess there is no simplicity in Christ. I, I mean, the only way I can save is I got to go to your church because you got to teach me. What does that sound like, folks? Do you see why I said this is Roman Catholic to the core? It is, man. It's just playing off Roman Catholic doctrine. They call it something different. And if you said, dude, you're just Roman Catholic, they would look at you like, no, we're not. Don't ever say. Yes, you are. You're teaching the same. You want to know what Satan does, man? He's a master of it. He's a mastermind. He takes all the things that he's taught in history, and he just spins it a different way. That's what he does. How about this? If you do not know the five points of Calvinism, you do not know what the Bible teaches about the gospel or salvation, but rather some perversion of it. So there you go. If you want to understand the gospel, then you have to understand Calvinism and the five points of, 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 of Calvinism. I mean, if you don't believe that's what, here, this is point blank. Ready? Calvinism is the gospel. To teach Calvinism is, in fact, to preach the gospel. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just say this. Let's take L. L in, the, in, in TULIP. T-U-L-I-P, okay? Let's take L. L stands for limited atonement. Now, to understand limited atonement, okay, because this is the gospel, okay, to understand it, you have to be uniquely qualified to understand it. So you can't understand limited atonement, which is part of salvation because TULIP is the gospel, okay? You can't understand it without a uniquely qualified person like myself. Well, here, this uniquely qualified person is going to help you understand it. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That don't sound so limited to me. That sounds like he loved the world. How hard was that? Did you need me to get that? It is God's will that how many men? All men be saved. Don't sound like a, you need some me up here standing here telling you anything about this. Huh? Go ahead. Somebody else drop some verses for me. I know you had one. Not the propitiation for our sins, but the whole world. I mean, how hard is this? Did you need me to grab onto that? But you want to know what a Calvinist does? It was your fault. You told me to do it. It was a Listen, you want to know what a Calvinist does? You think I'm joking? Go ahead. Bring them to John 3.16. Watch what they say. Well, God didn't really mean the world. What he meant was the elect. <laughs> well, then why didn't he write that? If that's what he meant, why didn't he just say, for God so loved the elect? Why did he say, for God so loved the world. If he only meant that the elect was the ones to be saved, then why didn't he say that? Why did he say the world? And by the way, while we're on that word elect, y'all should be with me, tra tracking with me right now. Who was it that's the elect? Yes, but who, who is the elect? Jesus is. He's the elect. We're not the elect. We are only the elect if we're in Christ. Hello? Go back and if we compare Scripture with Scripture, which we should be doing, we'll find out that there are only two people in the Bible that are the elect. 
the Jew, and Christ. That's it. Those are the elect. We're not elect. We're not elect for anything. We were never elected for anything. We never will be elected for anything. We only get in on the election because we are. If a doctrine is so confusing that we can't understand it, let me just drop this to you as much as I can, as simple as I can. If there's a doctrine that is so confusing that you need me to help you understand it, or if you need any spiritual guru to help you understand it, it's probably not right. Matter of fact, it isn't. It isn't. It's not right. Yes, do you need pastors to help help you along and understand it? Yes, no doubt. But at the end of the day, you should be able to go, oh, okay. And learn it on your own. Because if you got the Holy Spirit inside of you, guess what? It's the same one that's inside of me. We got the same guy. And if we have his mind, you don't need some special spiritual guru to help tell you what the Bible actually means. Do you understand what I'm saying, guys? Y'all feeling me here? I know I'm getting a little hard on this. But I just want you to understand, this is a serious deal. It's all your fault. It's a serious deal. Was I too hard on that? I could have probably been a little harder. But I probably could have been a little nicer. I just want to make sure we're grabbing onto this, man, because this is taking hold of the church today. Far more than we think or understand and I'm telling you, one of the biggest problems I see is the fact that they're hiding it. And listen, okay, although we all have the ability to understand, not all of us, let's be honest, take the time to dig into the Word to make sure that we can understand. Do you follow what I'm saying? And if that's you, in other words, I'm talking about Second Timothy right now, where, where the Bible says, Study. Which, by the way, if I had an ESV Bible, which is a, uh, a favorite Bible of a Calvinist, it doesn't say study. Do your best. Just do your best. Well, that's not what God said. God didn't say do your best. Because you want to know what happens when you do your best? You fail. No. Study. Do show thyself worthy and approved. Unto God, rightly dividing, which means what? We can wrongly divide it. And by the way, we can be ashamed if we're not studying. And what ends up happening is if we wrongly divide it, which is what a Calvinist does. They wrongly divide it. That's the problem, which is the problem with any. Uh, I've heard Mark Trotter say it like this. 90% of doctrine is true. 10% of it is the problem. They, 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 they got it. They just took it to the wrong person. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, they are right. There are people who, quote, unquote, can lose their salvation. But it isn't the people in the church. It's the Jew. That, it's the Old Testament saint could, and it's the tribulation saint can not the church. It's correct doctrine written to the wrong person. We're not the elect. Jesus is. Correct doctrine to the wrong person. And the only way we get any glorification of the elect is because we're in Christ. If you just grab on to the simple truths that are and again, this is why I say, man, listen, this is why we have to be Either we believe this book or not. Either every word of God is pure or it's not. Either you think you have the word of God in your lap or you don't. If I ever correct it, see that door? Run out it as fast as you can because I have no right to correct what God said. None. None. I have no right to add to what he said. 
I have no right to take from what he said. He gave us 66 books. He is the great counselor. He is the word of God. To take and separate the word of God from the person of Jesus Christ, you can't. They are the same. To say you love God, you must love his word. To say you love Jesus, you must love his word. It, 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 you can't separate them. Yet, in the church today, there is much separation of the two. A lot of it. Okay. There's my high horse. Take that for whatever is worth to you. Uh, you say, well, why did you spend so much time really hammering that today? Weren't you supposed to get to page 18? Uh, yes, that is all true. Uh, but I also think it is true that we, uh, listen, listen, at the end of the day, we all have to make our own decisions on stuff. I'm not telling you who you should listen to, who you shouldn't listen to. I'm not telling you if you listen to any of those guys, man, or if you ever read any of their books that you're some crazy, that you're following wrong. you you got to make that decision on your own. Okay, I'm just telling you, from my position, okay, as the pastor of this church, I, I don't buy that stuff at all. I see the many, many uh, uh, verses in the Bible that, man, what do you do with these verses if that is correct? Okay? And so, for me, I don't like to live there. I don't like to have to figure out what verses mean on my own. Because if I have to do that, I'm going to screw it up. I'd rather just God do it. He, he has a better track record than I do on that one. And, and I'd rather him just, and if, 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 if I've got to go and go, well, okay, only the elect are saved, well, that throws verses like John 3.16 off. We've got to do something with that, and it's not my right to go into John 3.16 and change what it says. That is what it says. And in the Greek, the word is cosmos. It is not elect. It's cosmos. And what do you say? What is co well, what is cosmos? Well, come on. I think we all, that's where we get our root word from, cosmo, co not cosmetology, how women dress themselves up. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay, uh, although God did dress up the universe, right? God did make the universe beautiful. This is why women have to, no, that's not true. Uh, but do you understand what I'm saying, man? It's what the word says. I mean, come on, you don't need to change it. That's what it says. It, nowhere in, in, in any way, shape, or form is that word anywhere close to elect. And what's crazy is, and what, what I find absolutely nuts, is that they're not even following their own belief system. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, because even if you took the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, even if you went there, it says cosmos too. Like, so now where are you getting, where are you getting that he meant the elect? Like, give me a give me something. Any manuscript that said it. Nope, none. Well, then I'm probably gonna guess he meant cosmos. And I know what my problem was and why this is all messed up. I have it backwards. I figured it out just now. That's why I keep correct. I... Yeah, I, I lied. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. Let's pray, and we'll uh, be done. Uh, if, if you, uh, I guess, I don't know. Ray, were, were people supposed to fill this out? Here, I'll give it to Ray. I can't, I can't come down here. Can you come up here? If I go down here, I'm in lava. Y'all yeah. <laughs> know you played that when you were kids. This is lava. Well, I'm standing. In You're the dead. There. Right? So we have a, a sign-up sheet for the next uh, next week. If you want to be part of uh, the one class, please sign up on the sheet. And that way we'll. Because I do have I do have some uh, uh, stuff that I'm going to be giving out, so that way Ray doesn't have to print unnecessary. Yeah, that's a good idea, Ray. Thank you. All right, let's pray, and we will be dismissed. And uh, uh, once again, uh, I do apologize. I went a little over. Um, all right, Father, we uh, come before you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that we have the ability to uh, understand it. Uh, we thank you that, uh, man, if we would just submit to it, we would know what it is your will is for us. Uh, so, Lord, I, I, I do pray uh, that we would be a church that... Uh,
we would just be seeking your truth. Uh, Lord, there's a lot of times we can uh, bring our own ideas and thoughts and presuppositions into your word that, you know, sometimes we have to, uh, we have to get rid of them. They're not, they, they may not be correct. Uh, Lord, I, I just pray that if there's anything I said this morning uh, that's incorrect, uh, Lord, uh, that you would uh, expose that. Uh, not only to uh, myself, but uh, to the rest of the folks in this church. Uh, I certainly do not want to stand up here in your pulpit and uh, preach something that's incorrect. Uh, but Lord, if it is correct, uh, Lord, I pray that we would uh, marinate on those things, meditate on those things, and that uh, in the end we can understand who we are in you and what it is you've purposed us to do so that we can be the church you've called us to be. Uh, in these last days. And we'll certainly give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name I pray. And all the church said? Amen. Love you all. Have